welcome our Vox Church family right now. Vox is one church in six locations, so all across the state of Connecticut and also in Massachusetts, New Haven. Can we welcome all of our locations this morning? Good morning. We love you. My name is Justin. I'm the lead pastor here at Vox. Welcome to church. You made it. Amongst all the crazy responsibilities of your life, you have made time to meet with God and to meet with the people of God. So well done. I'm glad you're here, and I'm so excited to share with you this morning. You know, last week we got to hear from my wife. Were you guys encouraged by Chrissy's message last week? I know I was. Awesome word. Awesome word. And we are officially beginning the Christmas season. Do we have any Christmas people out there? Come on, I know there's a few of you that you start in like August, you know, and you're just like always preparing for Christmas. Well, this year Vox is doing something special. We've never done this before. We've tried in the past to do one large gathering that we can invite our whole church to. That's gotten more and more challenging as the geography of our church has increased. So this year, Friday, December 21st, 6.30 p.m., and Sunday night, December 23rd, 6.30 p.m. We're going to have two regional gatherings, one in Hartford, that's Friday, and then one here at the College Street Music Hall, uh, uh, Sunday night, that's, sun, that's uh, the 23rd. And we're going to be gathering as many as we can, so Bridgeport, Middletown, uh, Springfield, come to one of those two gatherings and we are going to worship Jesus on Christmas together. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. The theme of our service this time is majesty, and we'll have all of our normal Sunday morning gatherings that Sunday, the 23rd, but we want to do some special evening Christmas celebration. So mark your calendar. Be a part of, uh, of that incredible time. It is going to be awesome. Our team has been prepping for that for a long time now, and uh, it's going to be great. This is also a sacred time in the calendar of our church. And so if you're new to Vox, maybe you're kind of new to this, but for the next four weeks, we'll start a teaching series called Reach. Turn to your neighbor and say, you got to reach. Come on. You've got to reach. And we culminate this series on December 9th, where we'll receive our end of year offering. And this is the time of year that as a church, we ask you really to bring your best gift to the house of God. All right. So this is your opportunity to dig deeper financially and say, you know what? I'm going to invest in what's going to happen beyond 2018, 2019, and 2020. And so over the next four weeks, we're going to be outlining some of the things that we'll be taking on, some of the places that our church will be going over the next year. And so it's an exciting time. This is probably my favorite time of year every year to be able to share this stuff with you. And so I want your heart to be preparing, praying, seeking God beyond my tithe, beyond my normal giving. God, how can I be a part of what you're doing on the earth through this church on December 9th? So mark your calendar for that time. That's an important Sunday. But also as we're looking at these four weeks leading up to December 9th, we're going to be examining a key passage of scripture that I believe is a word from God for our church, okay? And so this is originally a prophetic word given by the prophet Isaiah to the people of Israel who were in captivity at the time that the word was given. But what we're told in scripture is that this is actually a symbol of what God does through his church. And over the last nine months, it's been this passage of scripture that our leaders, our elders, actually it's probably happened four or five times where someone has come to me and said, you know, I've been praying for the church, I've been praying for you. And this passage of scripture has been on my mind, you know, and by like the third time I'm thinking to myself, there's something to this, you know, God has something to say to us through this verse. So we decided to use the last four weeks of this series to, um, to really focus in on these five verses in the 54th chapter of Isaiah. So I'll read them all to you today. And uh, this morning we're really just going to focus on verse one, but follow along with me. Isaiah 54, starting in verse one, sing, O barren one who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Remember, this is a prophetic word. Enlarge the place of your tent. Let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you will spread abroad to the right, and to the left, your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth. Somebody say, thank God, right? You will forget the shame of your youth, the reproach of your widowhood. You will remember no more, for your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer, the God of the whole earth 
He is called. Now as we take this next four weeks in this series called Reach, I want to begin with a sermon, and the title, if you want to jot it down today, is Your Song is a Seed. Your Song is a Seed. Every location, Your Song is a Seed. Would you pray with me this morning? God in heaven, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the privilege of being able to share this morning, and I thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. God, would you empower me by your Spirit to take the word that you've written on my heart, and by your power, write it on every single open heart today. Lord Jesus, right now we gather with various trials, various struggles, various life situations going on, and I thank you that by the power of your Spirit you can take this word and you can speak prophetically to every one of us. So I ask that you do that this morning in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. amen, amen, amen. Hope, hope. You know you can't live without hope. You know, balcony, it is impossible for you up there to live without hope, right? Right now you are hoping that the cement that holds up that balcony will not collapse, right? We all are living every moment with a necessity for hope. What is hope? There's many different definitions, different ways people have described hope, but hope is a growing expectation that good is on its way. Hope is a belief that things will get better. Researchers, medical professionals for generations have been studying the incredible, profound implications of a person who has hope. One study you may have heard of, 1957, famous study, uh, Dr. Kurt Richer, he uh, did a study using rats to try to understand hope in every type of situation. And so he takes a bunch of rats, and if you have a affection towards rats, this is a bit of an offensive study, but what he would do is he would take bunch buckets of water and he would take a rat and drop it in the bucket of water and start a timer and, and wait to see how long it took that rat to drown, okay? And so the average drowning time of the rat was 15 minutes. I know it's kind of barbaric, but that's what he would do, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, and again and again and again, uh, the all, again and again, you know, every rat right around 13, 16, but the average time was 15 minutes. And so then he added a second variable to his experiment. What he did is he would drop the rat in the water and it would start to struggle and start to drown and just as the 15 minute mark hit, the rat would start to sink and give up, but just as before the rat drowned, the, uh, the experimenter would scoop up the rat and take them in its hand and it would dry the rat off, give it about a 60 second rest and put it back in the water. Now you would think how much longer is that rat going to last, right, now that it's been, you know, rested for 60 seconds and put back in the water. You might say, oh, it lasts another 15. You know, it lasts another 20 minutes. Well, what the researchers found is that on average, the rats that had a 60 second rest lasted, are you ready, another 60 hours. 60 hours, something changed in the mind of those rats. So how did the swimming capacity of a drowning rat multiply by 240 times? The only explanation that the researchers could come up with is hope that these researchers gave those rats a reason to keep swimming. They gave them hope that some hand would swoop down and scoop them out of that water again and they could survive. And hope somehow transformed those rats into elite swimmers. See, your heart needs hope, and your capacity, oh, this is a word for somebody, hasn't even begun to be discovered because when God's hope gets in your soul, your abilities are going to expand far beyond what you ever thought was possible. I'm only two minutes in, I'm already feeling it. God wants to do something in your heart today. He wants to unleash a supernatural hope on the inside of you that enables you to do what you didn't even think was possible. In Isaiah chapter 54, we are introduced to a woman who is struggling with infertility, all right? A woman who is struggling with infertility, and for many of us, we could testify. I don't know your story, but I know that there are many, many, many people right now at Vox Church that you could testify that this is one of the most challenging situations a woman or a couple could ever face. That infertility cuts to the core of who we are, that longing for a child and that inability to conceive. It is a burden unlike any other, and I know that there are many in the room that would say that is true. I've gone through that. My family's gone through that. It is so difficult. Now, in Old Testament times, the woman who had many children 
was a national hero. See, in those days, large families meant large harvest. Large harvest meant large income. Large income meant strong nation. And so they were a national hero if you had many kids. But the woman who was barren, she was a national disgrace. And she was often blamed for her barrenness. It wasn't right, it wasn't godly, but it was what often happened in those days. And so if you were not able to have kids, it literally meant that your family line ended. It meant that the inheritance that was passed on from generation to generation was lost. It meant that you were most likely going to end up in poverty. And it even meant for some women that you would die of starvation because as you got older and could not work, there was no one to take care of you. And so the shame and the weight of barrenness was often unbearable. Now, Isaiah introduces this imagery as a symbol. It's a symbol of anyone who is hopeless. And so it goes beyond just physical barrenness. He's talking about issues of the heart. And the prophet addresses this woman, if you noticed, three different times. He says, sing, O barren woman, sing the one who has not born, sing the one who did not bear, sing the one, and he keeps talking to her. And it's strange as you read this verse because you think to yourself, why is he consistently bringing up her barrenness, right? It seems almost callous, like why are you drawing attention to her struggle, Isaiah? But he's trying to show us, church, that there is in hopelessness a progress. That hopelessness is by nature progressive, all right? It's not an on and off switch. Hopelessness happens in stages over time in our lives. And so what we see here is what we'll call a spectrum of hopelessness. And I want to show it to you today. You can put it up on the screen. The spectrum of hopelessness. So he begins at the end, right? In the end, he says, you who have not been in labor, all right? You have not been in labor. Now, this is the time in your life where something you want to happen is not happening, okay? And so this applies to various different issues and struggles in our life. You know, why have I not found the career that I love? You know, why have I not, you know, obtained the success that I thought I was going to? obtain? Why have I not found the relationship that really satisfies me in this life? Why have I not had that big break in my business that I've been pushing for? And so when you're in this stage of the spectrum, your, your life and your feelings in this area are marked by frustration. Come on, turn to the person next to you and say, I've known some frustration. I've known some frustration we all have, right? And so it's this frustration that leads us to say, it isn't happening now, right? It isn't happening now. And I don't understand why it isn't happening now. And that frustration as time goes on evolves into desperation. Desperation, and that's why he calls her, you who did not bear, right? Did not bear, like the season is passing. It still hasn't happened yet. You did not bear. And so this is where things get frustrating. You know, it's been a while, God. It's been longer than I expected. I thought the big break would have come by now. I thought the, you know, the success would have manifested by now. God, I've paid my dues. God, it's been some time. And in many ways, I'm talking to somebody right now, it feels like I'm further back than when I started. And I've been sacrificing. I've been investing. I've been giving but the relationship isn't growing, nothing's happening, and it moves to desperation. And then lastly, the hopelessness takes over inside, and he calls her, O oh, barren one. See, now it's not just something she has or something she's done, it's who she is. It's her name. You see that progression? It's now her identity that she just is the barren one. And this is when the heart becomes convinced that it won't happen ever. It won't happen ever. And the dream starts to die on the inside. You can take my spectrum down. I wonder, have you ever traveled down the road of hopelessness? Have you ever walked the stages of this spectrum? I bet you probably have. I think if you look at your life, you could find many different circumstances and scenarios where you have experienced this spectrum. I remember when I was a kid, seven years old, 
My parents were separated, and I can remember as a young kid, you know, when you're that young, it's just weird. You know, you don't have a grid for it. You know, mom and dad are doing their best, and they love you, and, and my parents were very gracious, but, you know, they were separated, and, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, well, when is, when is dad moving back in? You know, I'm just being honest, you know? When is, when is this going to become normal again? And time goes by, and as a kid, you start to get frustrated. I know that many of us have experienced this change in family life. You get frustrated, and, and I start feeling like, this isn't right, like, I, I, I want to, you know, and then, and then things become more permanent. You know, the divorce is finalized and, you know, dad gets a condo and, and life starts to move on and that frustration starts to move to desperation. But if I'm honest, and it's kind of tragic looking back, if I'm honest, what I can say is that for me, it didn't really sink in until my parents were remarried. And I started to realize that, hold on a second, pause still, this isn't something temporary. Life is never going to go back to the way it was before. Have you ever traveled down the spectrum of hopelessness? I'm sure you have. I'm sure you have. Many of us have traveled down it in many ways, in many circumstances, and that's just one example. But those low expectations, if you're not careful, can actually just become for you and for me a way of life that I just don't expect much of relationships. I just don't expect much of our government. I just don't expect much of people. I just don't expect much of God. I just don't expect much from myself. Because it's not just circumstances or people that let us down. Come on, let's just be honest. You've been letting yourself down more than you'd like to admit. See, this spectrum of hopelessness testifies to the fact that there is something broken in you. Something that you and I so desperately try to avoid and secretly try to conceal. But if we are honest, we are all aware that there is something in me that's just not right. See, the barren woman is actually a symbol of the human condition. The symbol of the human condition that there is inside of me something that is broken, something that's not supposed to be. Maybe for you it's a fear. Maybe for you it's an anxiety. Maybe for you it's a lust. Maybe for you it's an addiction. Maybe for you it's a pride. Maybe for you there's a, a thousand different ways that this manifests in our lives, but there's something off in me, and I want to bring forth life. I want to manifest life, but I can't. I want to change, and I try and I try and I even do good things but I can't seem to be good in my core be good before God there is something in me I have seen that I just can't fix I don't know if you've ever experienced that before don't leave me up here alone Justin's honesty moment the rest of you are like we're actually fine everything's perfect in my life Justin Some of you, it's lying. That's your biggest problem. <laughs> huh. The crazy thing about Isaiah 54, the thing that makes Isaiah 54 so glorious, church, and the reason I want to study it for the next four weeks, is that before Isaiah 54, guess what there is? Isaiah 50, yeah, this wasn't a trick question, 53. Yeah, you're like, I don't know, man. What is it? 53. 53 comes before. Yeah, I, before Isaiah 54, there is Isaiah 53. And if you're familiar at all with Isaiah 53, what you know is Isaiah 53 is a prophetic promise from Isaiah 600 years before Jesus ever walked the earth that specifically outlines the plan of a coming Savior and what he will do to wash people of their shame. So look at with me a portion of Isaiah 53. It says this, surely he took our pain and bore our suffering. Speaking of a coming Savior, Jesus, yet we considered him punished by God stricken by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions written before crucifixion was invented. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. We all, we all, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of 
of us all. And then as Isaiah 53 finishes in this glorious display of what the Savior will do, then you read Isaiah 54, look at it with me again, sing, O barren woman who did not bear, break forth in singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor for the children of the desolate one will be more than her who is married, says the Lord. See, God interrupts our mourning. God interrupts our brokenness. God interrupts your hopelessness with a promise. Oh, you need your, your heart needs that today. Come on, turn to somebody around you and say, I've got a promise. I've got a promise. We got to get you talking today. I've got a promise. He interrupts. Oh, somebody today came in hopeless. Somebody today came in on that spectrum of hopelessness and you frustration, it's moved to desperation and your desperation is teetering on that concept that says it won't ever happen. And that's beginning to sink in on your soul. I don't know in which area, in which way, but I know that for many of us, that's been your story and God wants to get your attention today. He, wanna, he wants to interrupt your mourning. He wants to interrupt your frustration. He wants to interrupt your desperation with a promise from heaven. A promise, and what is the promise that is given to this barren one? Oh, I love it. The promise, church, is new birth. The promise is new birth. See, this is describing the church. It is a prophecy that was written to Israel many years ago, but it's quoted in Galatians chapter 4 in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul as a prophetic word for the people of God. See, God is describing his plan for humanity, that his plan is for Christ to come and for Christ to die in my place and for Christ to wash me of my shame and then for Christ to rise from the grave and to send forth his Holy Spirit and that his Holy Spirit would take up habitation in my heart by faith and through that spirit he would transform my barrenness into fruitfulness. That is God's word for you today that he has come to transform your barrenness into fruitfulness in Jesus' name. And because, oh, you got to see this today. I wish I could just preach on this, but we have to preach the whole text. But because Christ's spirit is now in the believer, don't miss this. Behold the glorious truths of sound theology. Because Christ's spirit is in the believer, Christ's position is imputed to the believer. Let me explain it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says it like this. He says, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is preached among you by us, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been, what's the next word? It has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, he's made over 7,800 by the way, for as many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. They are yes in Christ. In other words, Christ lived the perfect life that you and I could not. Christ died a substitutionary death so that he could wash me of my sins. Christ rose from the grave and put his spirit in my heart so that now when the Father sees me, he sees Christ. And every promise in the scripture now is seen through the lens of Christ in me and his answer to me me is yes. So God fulfills every promise for me because he sees Christ in me and he answers yes. And so there are promises of provision. Oh, you got to find some of those. There are promises of protection in the Bible. There are promises of peace. There are promises of favor, but the greatest promise is the one that will help you most sleep at night, the promise of eternal life eternal life. And when these promises start to get on the inside of you, something starts to change. But if you're like me, you have noticed a gap. You have noticed a gap between the fullness of God's promise and the reality of my circumstance. You have noticed a gap between what God has said is mine and what I have experienced as mine. Come on, can anybody testify to that? You've noticed a gap and you say, you know, there's this chasm between what God says, by his stripes I am healed, and what I experience, I'm still battling with this thing. This, you know, the gap between God will provide all your needs according to his riches and glory, and how do I pay that electric bill? There's a gap. There's a gap between all your children will be taught by the Lord and great will be the peace of your children, and have you seen my kids recently? There's a gap, right? And so what do we do with this gap? What do I do when God promises me one thing and life gives me something different? What do we do? 
Well, Isaiah 54 gives us the answer. He says, in those moments, O barren one, you should sing. You should sing. You should sing. Come on, tell somebody around you, you should hear me sing. Come on, tell them. <laughs> Scientists tell us that singing is a natural antidepressant, that no matter how terrible you sound, it will do something in your biology. Singing releases oxygen in the brain, which boosts the immune system and reduces stress. But singing also carries a mysterious power, a mysterious power to wake us up on the inside. I read a story recently about a seven-year-old girl who had a hemorrhage in her brain. She's in a coma. The doctors tried to do everything they possibly could to help her, and they got to a point where they realized there's just nothing else we can do. They called the parents inside the room and they said, listen, we've tried everything with your daughter and we are convinced that she's not going to make it much longer, so you should take your time to say your goodbyes right now. But mom had a different idea. Mom leaned up next to her daughter, true story, saw it in the news. Mom leaned up next to her daughter, right by her bedside, and right into her ear, she starts singing the daughter's favorite Adele song. Come on, somebody thank God for Adele, right? <laughs> starts singing her favorite, happened to be rolling in the deep, okay? So here she is, whispering in this girl's ear, there's a fire, and you know I sound like Adele, burning in my heart. Reaching a fever tip is bringing me out the dark. And she starts singing this song, and suddenly, suddenly, suddenly this girl wakes up. See, just as the barren woman is a symbol of the human condition, just as the barren woman is a symbol of our barren hearts because of sin, so singing is a symbol of how hope wakes up, all right? And in the same way as God in this text gives us three names for the barren woman to show us the progress of hopelessness, so three times she is told to sing in three unique ways so that we can see how hope progresses in the heart. Let me show it to you. He says first, he says, sing, O barren one. Sing. Now that word sing literally just means emit sound. Make a noise. Something just needs to start. You don't have to sound pretty. You don't have to uh, sound polished. Just act. Just start singing. Start singing. That's the first thing. And then he says, break forth in singing. Break forth in singing. That's the Hebrew word for bursting. It's to break open. It pictures ice that is cracking and melting and splitting apart. It pictures a rock that is crumbling. And so first he says, just make some noise. And then he says, it's going to start breaking things. It's going to start shattering things. And then the third time he says, cry aloud. Cry aloud. Now the root of that Hebrew word is not cry aloud out of desperation. It is cry aloud out of victory. Make a victory sound. In fact, the original Hebrew is actually, it's kind of strange, neigh like a mighty stallion. That's what he tells us to do. You're like, that's ridiculous. Well, you're depressed, so this might help. Make the sound of a war horse, bellow. And so what he wants us to see is a spectrum of hope. Go ahead and put it up on the screen for me so you can see it. A spectrum of hope. See, hope begins in our hearts with an action, right? I step out on the promise. That's where hope starts, right? An act of faith. Okay, that is so critical. We'll come back to that in a second. But then from there, God begins a work of reconstruction. That is the break, right? The ice starts to crack. The boulder starts to crumble. Something starts to change in my heart. He breaks up this thing in me. My heart is changing. And then from there, action reconstruction leads to this divine confidence, this assurance, right? This confidence that says, I know God is with me, and though I may not see it, I know he is faithful, and though it hasn't happened yet, I know he won't leave me. I am victorious. And so hope starts to grow inside of me as I go through this process. But before there's assurance, before there's reconstruction in the heart, there must be this act of faith. You notice the woman is told, sing before you conceive. Sing before, now how awkward is that, right? 
Sing before you conceive. Notice the tension. It's like, mm, I'm still barren. No, 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 start singing how happy you are. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually not happy. No, 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 start singing now. Sing before you conceive. Maybe you remember the story of the 10 people who had leprosy in Luke chapter 17. They come to Jesus and they say, oh Lord, would you heal us? And he doesn't touch them. He doesn't pray for them. He just looks at them and he says, go and show yourselves to the priests as men who have been healed. And in that moment, I could imagine it was mildly awkward because they're standing there, 10 people dying of leprosy. They look at Jesus. He says, go show yourself to the priest as one who has been healed. And they're looking at themselves and going, but we're not healed, Jesus. Like this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You're telling us to go and show ourselves to the priest as if we were healed, but we haven't been healed. He says, go. And the scripture gives us an incredible, incredible mystery. It says, as they went, they were healed. As they went, they were healed. See, their going was an act of faith. Maybe you remember the story of Joshua as he brings the people of God into the promised land. And what we're told is they get to the banks of the Jordan River and it's in flood stage and they cannot cross into Jericho. And so they don't know what to do and the Lord says, I'm going to part the sea for you just as I did the Red Sea. And Joshua says, that's great God, any time would be fine. And he says, how about right now? And, and Joshua says, well, yeah, right now it would be good, but you haven't done it yet. And, he, and, and God says to Joshua, oh, the problem is you've got to actually step into the torrential flooding water before it parts. Just step into it, Joshua, and then I'll do it. Your act of faith is going to do something. And so that's what he does. He steps into the water, and as soon as the priests enter the water, the waters part. See, God gives you a promise, and he's given you over 7,000 of them. He's given you promises, and he qualifies you by God's grace through Christ to receive the promise. But your act of faith sets the promise in motion. You might want to jot that thought down today. Your act of faith, oh, I pray God gets this in our spirit today. Your act of faith sets the promise in motion. In other words, your song is a seed. Your song is a seed. You've got to plant the seed if you're ever going to have a harvest. See, some of us, if we're honest, we're looking for God's blessings but we haven't planted any seeds. See, you've got to trust him first. You've got to act on that trust first. Your act of faith sets the promise in motion. And for many of us, you're here and you're struggling with this or you're struggling with that. You've got this problem or that problem. You're wondering why God hasn't intervened. And what God would say to you today is, what seeds of faith are you planting in your actions that will release the promise in your life? Sing, O barren one, before you conceive. You know, for 16 years now, my wife and I have paid our tithe before we paid our mortgage. All right? In other words, we have given generously to the work of God through the church before we have paid for our basic necessities in life. We've paid our tithe before we paid our groceries. And you think to yourself, that's crazy, Justin. You've got to eat. That's crazy. You've got to pay your bills. You can't neglect those things. And I'm not saying that you should neglect those things. What I am saying is that God's given you a promise. And the promise is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And so my giving, oh, I'm getting personal now, my giving is an act of faith. And I do it first because it's my decree to God that I trust you with all my needs. And by the grace of God, in 16 years, we've never missed a mortgage payment. We've never missed any payment, actually, because God's grace has proven again and again and again it never fails. You're here at church today. You know that showing up at church is an act of faith? You could pursue overtime at work. You could pick up those extra hours. You could pick up that extra gig, but instead you decided to show up here. You know what that is? It's an act of faith. You're saying, God, I'm going to put you first. God, I'm going to prioritize your time with your people over other things in my life. Friend, when you do that, you unlock a promise. You release a blessing in your life. You know, when you wake up in the morning and you pray and you read the Bible before you check social media, yes, that is possible, right? When you do that, what is it? It's an act of faith. What you're doing in that moment is saying, before I check the weather, I'm going to set the temperature. Before I find out what everybody else is doing, I'm going to know what God is saying. And when you do that, you set yourself up. It is an act of faith to say, God, you are first. You are more important in my life. See, every day that you're faithful at work, 
It's an act of faith. Maybe your boss isn't kind. Maybe your company isn't fair, but you remain faithful, and you remain faithful. I'm talking to somebody today. You remain faithful. You know what that is? That's an act of faith, and it will set the promises of God in motion in your life. Maybe you're here today, and you have a marriage that is struggling, but you're faithful to your wife. You're faithful to your husband. You stay consistent every day that you make that choice. You are making an act of faith, and when you plant those seeds of faith in the ground, they begin to grow, and fruitfulness will come. It may not come the way you think. It may not come in the time in which you expect, but it will come in Jesus' name. It will. I was thinking about it like this. When I was a kid, I'd go camping. And one of my favorite things to go camping, it's kind of strange, but was to take a hot shower at the end of the day. Because all day long you're fishing, all day long you're running in the dirt and running in the mud and it's disgusting. And at the end of the day you take a hot shower. My dad would give me quarters, you know? And so we'd go up to the, to the, to the you know, bathroom things at the campground and you'd have to put a quarter in this little machine. You've seen them before. You turn the knob, it goes chunk chunk, and then the hot water kicks on, right? And you've got whatever, 10 minutes of hot water. And so I remember as a kid doing that so many times and just being like, Ah, you know, because of the beauty of some hot water after a long, dirty day. It's nice. See, that hot water is God's overflow in your life. He's got more than enough for you. He's got more than enough peace for your heart. He's got more than enough joy for your future. He's got more than enough provision for your lack. God has a storehouse of more than enough. But that quarter is the gift of God. It's the promise. It's what God has given us in Christ. I didn't earn that quarter from my dad. I didn't do chores to get that quarter. He gave it to me freely. But even though I had the quarter and I had the supply, it was my job, it was my job to put the quarter into the thing, to turn the knob, and my act of faith put the promise in motion, and there was overflow. You see that? Your act of faith sets the promise in motion. Some of you may not know, because I know that many of you are new in Springfield, all across our locations at Vox Church. Some of you may not know that this church was born out of a promise, that it was a promise from God that initiated my heart to take the step to plant this church with my family and with a small group of friends. And the promise that God whispered to my spirit and confirmed again and again and again in my heart that you hear me talk about all the time is this promise that in my lifetime, that in our lifetime, we would see this New England region, these six states of New England, transformed from the least religious place, the least Bible-minded place, the least spiritually alive place, to the most spiritually alive place on earth. That that least church region would become the most spiritually vibrant place. It was that promise that set my heart ablaze. But it wasn't enough, church, this is what you gotta see. It wasn't enough just to have the promise. I had to plant the promise. I had to act. Your song is a seed. I had to start singing before I conceived. We have to act in faith. And so over seven years time, this church has grown through acts of faith. See, every time you serve, every time you give, every time you sacrifice, every time we plant a new location, you know, other pastors will ask us, they say, oh, so you must plant a new location because you have hundreds of people traveling from Springfield, Massachusetts down to your Hartford location, and it just is required that you plant another church there, right? And our attitude's been like, well, no. Truthfully, oftentimes we have like five people from a location, but we sense that God wants us to reach the city. And so we step out and we spend $190,000 to buy all the equipment and all the preparation and rent the facilities and we step out in faith and we plant this church and when we do, we don't know if five people are gonna show up or if 500 people are gonna show up, but what we have found again and again and again and again six times now is that our act of faith puts the promise in motion. See, if you wait, for God to fill the room before you step out, the room's gonna stay empty forever. But if you step out in faith, there is no telling what God can do. And in this end of year season, end of 2018, I just wanna be really candid with you, church, that my heart has been so stirred, so stirred to reach God's people that don't even know they're God's people yet. I hear this call on the inside, go further, go further, 
go further. And if I close my eyes, I can actually see the people in my mind. Did you do this with me? Take a moment, just close your eyes. Close your eyes, because in my heart, I can see the single mom who doesn't yet know Jesus. She works at your store. She lives in your neighborhood. And it's just a simple invitation to Christmas. It's just a simple invitation to a Sunday service. And her entire trajectory of life is changed forever because eternal life became a part of the equation. Close your eyes, close your eyes, keep them closed just for a second. I can see in my soul a 21-year-old kid in Worcester, Massachusetts, a kid right now who's experimenting with drugs, who's going from relationship to relationship, who doesn't have any purpose, any focus, any direction, but it's going to be a church that gets planted in that city that brings a person to his neighborhood, a person to his doorstep that tells him about grace. And that 21-year-old kid meets Jesus, and his life is transformed. The addiction is broken. He marries a wonderful girl. They have kids, and their entire family tree is transformed because your act of faith set the promise in motion. You can open your eyes. How do we reach this region? How do we reach your friends? How do we stretch to see people's hearts and lives changed? It's going to take an act of faith. For the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about stretching. We're going to be talking about going further. And I want you right now to prepare your heart. I don't want to pull any punches. I want you right now to prepare your heart for December 9th. On December 9th, we're going to receive an offering at the end of the service. And we're going to give to start new churches. We're going to give to solidify some of the locations that we have so that we can reach more people. I'm going to be sharing more about that in the next couple of weeks. But as we do, I can know this for sure, that we're going to go as far as the seeds we plant will take us. That's it. And so this is a Christmas season where we can buy bigger TVs, and we can buy nicer cars, and we can buy beautiful clothes, and God wants to bless you. He wants to favor you in everything in life. But I want to challenge you to pull back from all the chaos of our culture and to say, God, what really matters in this life? God, what really matters on this earth? I've got a few years here, God. What do you want me to do with my life? And watch how he leads you to make an act of faith to see the gospel advance in ways you didn't even think were possible. In Jesus' name. All of our locations, would you stand to your feet with me today? I want to ask you a question this morning. Every person here, where is God calling you to act in faith? Where is God calling you right now to act in faith? Maybe you're here and the promises of God have not been realized in your life and you identify with the barren one. Maybe as I describe that spectrum of hopelessness, you know it all too well. Your frustration has moved to desperation. Your desperation has created in you a practical hopelessness that just accepts things as they are. I believe that today is your day by the power of the Holy Spirit to be set free from that cycle. I believe that today is your day for that cycle to be broken in your heart. Come on, I'm prophesying to you right now. It's going to take an act of faith. And I want to urge you today to place your faith in the only one who is truly faithful. I want to talk right now to every person in the room who is far from God. Middletown, Bridgeport, Hartford, North Campus, Springfield, here in New Haven. Right now, every location, if you are far from God, please, please hear my voice. Because if you listen hard enough, you'll hear God's voice. He's calling you right now. You were not created to live at a distance from your Creator. You were not created to go through life on your own strength. God has a strength for you that goes far beyond any natural human strength. But hope can't be found just in circumstances. 
Hope can't be found just in believing for a better tomorrow. You need an anchor for your hope. You need substance for your soul. And I can tell you that the only anchor for your hope is Jesus Christ. That Jesus came, God Himself in flesh. He lived a blameless and perfect life as your representative. He died on a cross 2,000 years ago to substitute His life for yours, and He did it because He loves you. Let that truth pierce your conscience today. He did it because He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. I said there's a God who loves you. You've been believing all sorts of lies about God as if you could get to Him by collecting enough good deeds. Friend, that's not the way. You'll always feel like you either are righteous in your own strength, which produces pride, or not good enough, which produces shame. The only way to get to God is by faith in Christ. He rose from the dead so that you could have eternal life. And today He offers you eternal life as a free gift, but you have to take an act of faith. You have to place your trust in Jesus Christ. One more time all across our locations, would you bow your head and close your eyes? I want to invite you this morning to receive Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to come back to Him if you've wandered away. I want to invite you to surrender to Him if you've clung to yourself. Right here, right now, God calls you to Himself. He calls you to give Him your life. I'm going to count to three in just a second, and when I do, if you're here and you're far from God and you want to surrender your heart to Christ at all of our locations, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you just to stick up your hand as a symbol of surrender to God, as an act of faith. Right here, right now, God knows your story. He calls your name. Maybe you came with a friend. Maybe you came with a relative. You didn't expect to be confronted with your relationship with God, and yet here you are, and He knocks on the door of your heart, and you can hear Him knocking. Don't ignore His voice. Come, Holy Spirit, whisper to the inner self, speak in the way that only you can. Right now, O oh God, break through our hardened hearts, awaken, awaken our souls. One, two. Three, if you've been far from God and you need to be reconciled, stick up your hand. Stick up your hand. God bless you. 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 All across this room, God bless you. God bless you. All across our locations, you may put your hands down as an act of faith. God bless you. God bless you. I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer of surrender, a prayer where you can place your faith in Christ. Whisper this to God today Jesus, save me. I believe you died and rose from the dead. I receive complete forgiveness of all my sins. I put my faith in you. Wash me. Fill me now. In Jesus' name. I want to talk to everybody in the room before we sing this song because I believe that this is a divine moment, a divine moment for every person in the room, that if you're here and you feel that gap between the fullness of God's promise and the reality of your circumstance, I want to urge you towards an act of faith today. Maybe for you, your act of faith is as simple as lifting your hands. Maybe for you, your act of faith is as, is as simple as calling out to God. I want to give you a promise right now. Maybe you need a miracle in a thousand different areas. And you say, Justin, I need to step across that gap. I need to trust God. I can tell you right now, He will respond if you take an act of faith, if you take that step. Psalm 91 verse 15 gives you a glorious promise. I want you to see it today. It says this, God says, when they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. When they call on me, let the promise get in your heart today. When they call on me, I will answer, says the Lord. When they call on me, I will answer. Friend, would you take that step of faith today?
Would you let your song be your seed today? When we sing this song this morning, you take your lack, you take your fear, you take your addiction, you take your anxiety, you take your trouble, you take your uncertainty, you take your worry, you take your problem, and you lift it up to God, and you say, God, as I sing this song, I take a step of faith, and I trust you, I trust you, I trust you, I trust you, and I believe with all my heart that the Word of God is true. When they call on me, I will answer. He's there to answer you this morning. Come on, let's pray. Let's pray. Would you lift your hands as that symbol of surrender this morning? God, in the name of Jesus, we lift our hands because we need you. We lift our hands because you're good. We lift your hands. We lift our hands because you're faithful. And we call out to you today. And as we sing this morning, may our song be our seed. God, may that song propel us into a place of absolute trust in you. God, every area where we need a miracle, every area area where we experience a lack, every place that we have a struggle. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, we stretch, we reach, we pursue you, and we say we believe in the God of the miraculous. And so the barren one is going to sing today because we know that there's a promise that we can hold on to in this life and the next. We welcome your Holy Spirit as we sing. Come on, all of our locations. Let's give them our best.